Today we're going to talk about product development methods. Um, ultimately, these are the methods, these are the ways that teams work together to get working uh, products shipped out the door at the end of the day. Some acronyms that will help us along include the PLC, Product Life Cycle, or PDC, Product Development Cycle. There are lots of others used as well, so it's kind of a fruitless activity to try to name every single one here. But what the PLC essentially is, are it's the steps or the stages that a new or an improving product goes through. And I do have some of those stages listed out on the next slide. Um, the product life cycle can include any of these steps. So ideation, which is essentially coming up with the ideas of what is it that we want to make? Where do we think that we can make money? Where do we think people will buy things? Um, so coming up with the features, the functions, the things that ultimately you want to build. Um, and then the next step is prioritization of those ideas. So ensuring that the most important ideas, the things that have to get finished, the things that will make or break your product, they're prioritized, or it could be that the things that are going to take the longest to build, they're prioritized to happen earlier in the process, and then things that maybe are cleanup or tweaks or they're more nice to have things than must have things, those might take place a little later in case we start to run out of time due to some unforeseen issues, and that will happen in any project. Um, design, so design can mean uh, you know, visual design regarding colors, pixels, icons on a on some sort of a screen or interface, um, and typically that that is what design means, but not always, because design could mean something like in the back end, how do systems talk to one another? What data does a system need to retrieve? Um, things like that. So design is really like the how, whether that's something that's visible to us on some kind of interface or not. Um, and after something's been designed and there's a validation that happens internally with the team and that's part of, of that design phase. But then there's also validation with users. And the reason that this is so important is that we're ensuring that it works for the users, it's solving the needs that they have, it's something that they want to use before we have people start de developing it. Because once they coders start to develop it, anything that wasn't right the first time that we could have validated through simple usability or user research is a waste of their time and it's a huge waste of company money. Um, but once we do have something validated, we then start to develop it. And development sort of happens in tandem with the QA testing, which is just making sure that the system will respond to any number of sequences, any number of data sets, um, you know, any number of mouse clicks in, in some order that makes sense. So QA testing is just making sure that there's not bugs, essentially. Um, and then there's marketing it, which uh, a lot of times marketing it will in include, you know, what what creative, what deliverables do we need to make? Do we need to make banners, flyers? Do we need to set up social media campaigns? Do we need to set up email campaigns? Do we need to have a booth presence somewhere at some event, like a physical presence? Do we need to sell samples of something if it's a physical product? Um, so, so marketing, you know, is basically getting the word out. Um, it could be ads. It could it could be other ways of marketing it. And then they're selling it, which selling it seems like it's very similar to marketing it, um, but marketing is more so about creating awareness um, and, and informing people of what it is and getting their feedback, but selling it is, is that act of, of transaction. Um, and selling it looks different when it's an enterprise situation versus something a little bit more e-commerce or B to C, which is business to consumer. So in an enterprise situation, what you're looking at is um, business to business, so you've got different account teams working with one another to handle the transactions, um, and they're sort of advocating on behalf of each of their companies versus a B2C scenario, but, uh, business to consumer, um, where you're selling directly to a consumer. So that would be like a website that sells clothes or, or some kind of goods that a company is selling. And then, of course, supporting customers. And again, depending on what the product or service is, if it's a physical product, it might mean making house calls, like, you know, if your Wi-Fi router isn't working, or it might mean handling shipping and returns if, if, if something arrives broken or damaged. It could mean having a help desk online or some kind of chat or email support or phone support. So, so supporting customers could mean a variety of things just depending on what the... Um, what the product actually is. And although this process looks linear because I have it listed in this list, um, the truth is that these processes are actually more sort of related. It's not that one and one step ends and the next step begins right after that. These things are kind of in more of a fluid motion. And we'll look at some graphics here in a second that better illustrate how these 
steps uh, relate to one another. With regards to how to get this, uh, this software you know, working and out the door, there are two main schools of thought. So there's Agile and Waterfall. Now I will say that Waterfall is not the main you know, way to do things anymore. It was for, for a time earlier on in, pro, in modern product development, um, but for the last handful of, you know, of years, maybe decade or more, Agile has really become the, the standard, the gold standard for how to produce software. Um, and as you'll see, if you look at the Agile icon, you'll notice that there's arrows moving backwards and forwards, which, which represents the team's ability to, to interact with each other, regardless of what stage the, the development process is in currently, versus Waterfall, where, again, I have that bulleted list. If you were to picture that bulleted list here, what that would say is, okay, so designers take however much time they need to take to design something, and then they immediately pass it on to the developers. And if you picture a waterfall, water can't travel up a waterfall. So if the developers have a question, or there's something about the design that won't work, or there's something that was missed, this model does not support the um, ad adaptive and iterative change and ability to kind of quickly move on the fly versus Agile does support that process. Let's look at another example. So waterfall again, if you picture these different steps and they have, they've used different terms, but the, this ultimately the end is the same. And so again, it's they finish one phase and then check that off the list and go right down to the next. But what this doesn't allow you to do is is to correct mistakes that might have been made earlier because of things that we the team didn't know about at the time. And in any IT project or software project, knowing accounting for the unknowns is one of the most important things, and it's something that good team members do and good successful product teams do because we, we know that there are things that we're going to miss because people aren't perfect or because there are things no one could have known about until you get into the guts of the software. And so Agile, if you'll notice, it has these interactions between not only what's coming after the step that I'm in, but also the step that was before me. And it's allowing also um, team members to circle back to me, and which means that we can make changes. The other hallmark uh, piece of Agile is that you release bite size, you release little pieces of software that are real, as in, you know, people can use them, they're out in the public. You release those at a time, and this is very good for multiple reasons. Number one, um, it allows you to cor make any mis uh, correct any mistakes that might have been made without having to change an entire huge piece block of code, which would take a long time and be much harder to do. Um, the other thing is that by releasing this little bit of software, we're getting feedback from customers all the time. And and notice too, if I've got this little chunk of software, if there's a mistake there, let's say that one of these hexagonal pieces or it starts to crack, um, if I need to change that, I can without um, w without changing the entire piece. Um, notice on the left, there's a giant big block, and it's a it's an impediment. It's massive, it's un it's not adaptable, it's not flexible, it's not iterative. And so these are some of the reasons that Agile really is, is the way that winning teams produce software nowadays. One of the other main staples of Agile is that it allows us to release minimum viable products or MVPs. This is an industry standard term and acronym. So if I just set out to create one huge piece of technology without really taking breaks, such as in this example, it's the car. So in this example that I'm looking at up here, my, my user is upset because they don't have a car, they don't have a way to get around. And I can say, as a product team, I say, okay, I'm going to build you this car. Now, it, you're not going to have it for, let's say, two years because it might take two years for me to research and design and whatever, create this car and actually manufacture it. Um, the other thing that that's not what that's not good about this is that you know if there was something wrong with my design if it's not the way you wanted the car to work if it's not the way you wanted it to look um, if there's features that were requirements for you that I didn't catch early on obviously you're not I'm not going to know about those until I give it to you at the very end and and maybe you'll like it but maybe you won't and it will be very hard for me to make changes to this finished thing um, that won't be very expensive. Now again, shipping out these little pieces of code at a time, you're upset initially, this, this customer is upset initially because they have no way to, they don't have transportation. Now, the quickest thing I can make you is a skateboard. 
You might not love it at first, but it will be faster than walking. It will be more efficient. And I can make incremental changes to the skateboard and eventually have a scooter. It's like, well, that's a little bit easier to use. I don't have to balance. You know, It's not as hard to balance. And then it's actually a little bit easier for me to upgrade that scooter to a bicycle than it is to, from a scooter. And, and again, this is just an analogy, so this isn't meant to be taken literally. But what this is saying is that I'm, I'm having constant, frequent checkpoints with my end user. And also on the back, on the back end that you can't see in this picture, the team is working together more uh, effectively, more fluent, uh, fluidly. Um, they're checking in with each other as well. So like, for example, in the first one, you know, the wheel team worked together. The wheel team then passed their work on to the chassis team or the axle team maybe. And then the axle team worked, passed their work on to the chassis team and, and all these teams were not working together. But that's actually what's happening at the bottom. All the teams are working together in some way, whether it's they're the main piece of the team at that point or not. And so of course, at the end of the day, I've given you the car still, and it might have taken the same amount of time. It might have taken more or less, but but the point is, you you had something to get around much faster than you did in the first model, and this is what we mean by minimum viable product. Now, at this point, I do have to settle a discrepancy. So, the waterfall method is an actual method. It's the t technical term for that. Uh, way of producing software. Whereas Agile is actually just any process that uses concepts from the Agile Manifesto, um, which incorporates all these pieces that we just spent the last couple of slides talking about uh, from 2001. So Agile is not an actual process to deliver software, but it, it is the umbrella term and there are more specific terms for the actual processes that teams might use. Agile um, helps with requirements gathering. So as I mentioned a little bit earlier, it's almost impossible to know all the requirements, not even requirements, but it could be challenges or constraints or limitations uh, in the beginning of a project because something will inevitably not be taken into consideration and only discovered later on. And we live in a world that's constantly changing and, and the waterfall method just simply is not adaptive enough. Picture a few years ago, you know, if you wanted to create an app like for a smartphone, you had to, one of the requirements was, okay, well, it has to live on multiple types of phones. It also has to be able to respond to tablet size. But then when you're, boom, suddenly we have wearable technology such as watches. And now the requirements are, it has to work on the previous types of devices, but it also has to work on a watch. And if you were working in the waterfall method, it would have been very hard to adapt quickly to the market to make your app respond to, to watch size. And so if you have a competitor that came to that market quicker, with the watch technology that you that you couldn't keep up with, that could be very, very detrimental to your business. As I mentioned before, um, Agile is just a, an umbrella term for these iterative approaches. Scrum, as you can see here, is the by far the most popular and widely used Agile method uh, for, for product development. So if you're going to be doing any further research into any of these topics, definitely start with Scrum and, and start to learn. If you're familiar with rugby, you may already know what the term scrum is, but if you're not, then uh, in rugby, when the, when the teams are huddled up in this position, there's a moment where they're moving together as one. So the, where, you know, they move to the left as one, they move to the right as one. And so scrum is really just a, it's an analogy for that level of teamwork, that level of unity, um, the team being aligned towards the same goal, and really working together as one body. So there are various industry standard terms that refer to Scrum specifically, not necessarily any Agile method. I won't read through all of them, but please feel free to pause the video at this point and read them on your own. And again, we have a second page here of some additional terms. And again, just feel free to pause if you need to take a second. Um, but notice, notice that the last one is user stories, and that's actually where we're going to pick up on the next slide. So user stories do follow a template, which is uh, as a type of user, I want some goal so that I can, you know, bl blank, so that blank. Um, let's look again at an example. As a parent of a sixth grader, I want to log into my child's school lunch account to see if I need to add more money. Now, this is a great user story. It's a really good example. And one thing that it doesn't do that, that a lot of novice story writers try to do, sometimes they'll accidentally include technical lingo. So for example, if in the back end you refer to, um, you know, if you were to say as a user type C, because that type C refers to sixth grade parents, or something like that, um, sometimes that'll make its way into these user stories, but it's, it's very important to stay user centric at all parts of the product development process. 
Um, it's also very important to include the, the last bit, which is that so that some reason, because I really need to understand why it is that they're trying to do what they're trying to do, because that's really half the picture that I need to paint. Let's look at one more example. As a VP of marketing, I want to identify how past holiday seasons have performed from prior advertising campaigns so that I can identify profitable ones. Again, perfect example of how to use the Now, if you were reading the definitions a couple of slides ago, you would have seen that on the Scrum team, it's a very specific set of people, such as the developers, the Scrum master, and the product owner. Um, and, and again, the Scrum manifesto was written by developers. There is a big movement or I guess school of thought that says that, yes, those are the people that create the software, but that team is not complete without some sort of user representation. So oftentimes, other people may integrate with the Scrum team, such as UX, and in these cases, UX is seen as equally a member of the Scrum team as anyone else uh, you know, t t traditionally would have been. The reason is because the study of how elements like design, functionality, and, and other aspects that user experience professionals have key insight in, into, um, it affects people's ultimate satisfaction with an ability to use the product, which clearly is of interest to the product, the Scrum team, because those are the developers developing that product and they want to be seen as successful, they want to succeed, and they care about users as well. Um, so UX is sort of an unofficial but very common and very important part of the uh, Scrum team. So thank you for listening to this presentation on the product development methods such as Waterfall, uh, Agile, Scrum, and some of the other topics that we talked about. If you do have any questions from this point, please reach out to your instructor. Thank you.